Thank you, everybody. If we could gather around for our closing, closing session. Let's hope everyone is enjoying themselves. Good afternoon. This is our, uh, our closing, closing panel, uh, the Unfounder panel. These people have founded nothing. <laughs> uh, but nonetheless, uh, they'll have a lot to say, uh, as you'll see in a moment. Uh, we're back tomorrow. Uh, our trainings are in the morning. Uh, we have a training uh, at 9, 10, uh, and 11. We'll see in the program the contents of those and, and who those trainers are. Uh, then we have open lunch period, and then we're doing our feedback on the feedback panel tomorrow at 1, which is where we have people who receive review from us who will come in and, and give us review on what we do. Uh, and then we get, and then we're doing a tech workshop where I explain the technology that we use to source reviews. And then our closing panel tomorrow is the challenge on challenges with some with Nancy and some other notable funders that have, that, that run major challenges. Uh, but for now, uh, Margaret and the very capable and attractive <laughs> unfounded <laughs> panel. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, guys. So um, when we were putting this together, we knew we wanted to have a founder founder panel and. My soapbox is kind of that you don't have to start something brand new to have an impact, right? I truly believe this. Um, I work with Dave. I did not start the, unf uh, the unfunded list. Um, I did not, he did. Um, but yet, I believe that I get to have a great deal of impact working with the unfunded list. Um, and so, I know there are other people, these are three of my lovely friends, cool. Anne, Marquis, and Elizabeth, uh, who also work with are the organizations where they get to have a great deal of impact um, within an established group. Just a few statistics. There are over 150 new nonprofits that were started between 2005 and 2015 at the federal level only. So this means they qualified with the IRS to be a nonprofit. That does not count state level nonprofits. There are over 627,000 new businesses started every year. So it's something to think about if you wanna be a founder um, there's a lot of people doing it, um, but make sure that you're doing it for the right reasons and you've done your research. We heard this morning the folks talking about the research they did before they ever took the first step to starting an organization. Um, so it's just something to think about that not everyone has to start something new. If you have an idea, make sure there isn't a group out there already doing it. I tell a fun story that will someday be a blog post. I'm <laughs> really going to write it. Um, cut, are you going to crush my dreams? And I was at an event. Everyone in the event had 60 seconds to get up and do whatever they wanted. You could lead the group in yoga. You could give a pitch for an idea. And a gentleman got up and uh, gave a pitch for an idea that he wanted to start an organization. It was, a great, it was a great idea. It needed to be fixed. But I also knew two very specific individuals at Pew who were working on this. And so I went up to him afterwards very excited I was like, I'm gonna introduce you to Nick and Susan. You need to talk to them. They are working on this. Let me help you. And he literally said to me, are you going to crush my dreams? Because his dream was to be a founder, not necessarily to work on this mission. Um, so it's, you know, again, something you don't have to start something new to have an impact. Um, I will stop talking momentarily and allow my lovely <laughs> guests here to introduce themselves give a little bit of their backgrounds, um, where they're coming from, where they work, and then we'll dive into all the fun topics. Anne? Uh, great, thanks Margaret. It's really, um, been, I'm glad to be here, and I, I really enjoyed the Founders panel as well, um, having uh, worked for a founder at some point, so we can talk about that. But I um, am now a director at the Pew Charitable Trusts, and because I am not a founder, I have to have a disclaimer that I'm here on my behalf and not speaking on behalf of Pew. <laughs> That's part of being part of a larger organization. Um, I direct three projects. One looks at student debt, one looks at broadband, and why a lot of uh, Americans still don't have it. And the other one is super DC wonky and looks at the um, federal, how federal decisions affect state budgets. So federal tax and budget policy um, can have a big impact on state budgets. And so. Um, Pew does a lot of other work, which we can talk about later. Um, I went to Pew because Pew is a, um, has a great reputation, has a history and track record of impact, um, and a lot of infrastructure and support around the work, the policy work that we do. Um, before that, I had um, 
worked for a group called, briefly called Survivor Corps, and that's the group where I was working for the founder. Um, I joined them also because they had a track record of in impact. They had previously been the Landmine Survivors Network and been part of the coalition that passed the Landmine Ban Treaty and won the Nobel Prize for that. Um, and I wanted to be part of a um, group that had the like, impact and did direct service to landmine survivors or survivors of war and also worked on policy issues. And prior to that, I worked for the New Mexico Voices for Children, which actually did not provide direct services, but looked at um, budget and tax policy in New Mexico to make sure that it was supporting low income families and kids. Um, they, I joined them because they also had a great reputation, um, a history of success and worked on issues that I felt very strongly about. And before that, I worked for federal and state government, but since this is about nonprofits, I can go on my soapbox later about how working for government also allows you to get a lot of impact, but we can talk about that later. All right, um, thank you. Uh, impressive body of work. <laughs> uh, my name is Marquis Fair. Um, I am also, I also work with the Unfunded, with Unfunded List. I am a friend of Dave's. Um, and I've, Dave and I have known each other for a very long time. I used to work with him at a little known, or, little known organization called Progressive Majority. Um, I am a career executive assist, assistant, and I currently work for Kaiser Permanente as the executive assistant to the CFO. Um, I am also not here as, uh, I don't, do not speak for Kaiser Permanente, um, but I am doing this type of work for this is my 18th year in administrative and executive um, level support. So I have worked for the government, uh, government organizations. I've worked for mom and pop shops, which are like three, four people. And I've also worked for, well, Kaiser Permanente is my largest one yet. Um, one of the uh, other panelists from the uh, founder panel from before um, probably ran across my organization, one of the organizations I worked with called the National Black Justice Coalition that I worked on um, LGBT issues at the intersection of um, people of color, specifically black people and LGBT people. So um, I was not the founder of that, but I did have uh, quite a bit of direct impact on their mission, policy, advocacy, et cetera. And um, I'll talk more about that later, but um, thank you for having me part as part of the panel. Have to get to go last after you guys. Great. Um, I also am only speaking on my own behalf. Um, Elizabeth Franklin. I'm. I work for an organization called the Cancer Support Community. We're the largest provider of social and emotional support services for cancer patients in the country, and we have several international um, affiliates as well. My background, I'm a social worker. All my degrees are in social work. Um, and when I went to social work school, I knew two things. One, I knew that I wanted to help people, as virtually every good social worker will tell you. And two, I knew that I wanted to run a nonprofit. So I eventually, you know, I wanted to be in administration. I focused on, on policy. Um, I was not particularly interested in doing a ton of um, clinical social work, so I didn't want to be a therapist, but I was very interested in running nonprofits. Um, that being said, I never necessarily wanted to found something, and that's why I'm sitting on this beautiful grass covered um, couch. So I worked at a national association. I've worked um, at an organization that was founded. The founder is still there. And we can talk about that. There's a little bit of founder syndrome. Um, I worked at GW with Margaret, and then I've been at CSC for um, about three years. And this summer, um, I'm being promoted from executive director of the Cancer Policy Institute to president of the organization. So, um, oh, thanks, guys. You're seeing my dream in action. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm just thrilled to be here. I completely agree with Margaret. Um, even in the cancer space, there is an organization for virtually every individual type of cancer and not only every individual type of cancer, but multiple organizations. So say there's lung cancer, there's 10 organizations focused on lung cancer. There are hundreds and hundreds of cancer nonprofits across this country, and many of them do fabulous work. Um, but I would argue if you want to go into something, you need to think long and hard about whether it exists. And if it doesn't, fabulous, go for it. Found an organization, knock it out of the park. If it does, join the people who are doing great work and, and join them to make a difference. And that's the way that I feel at CSC, that it combines my love of social work, mental health, um, cancer, and policy. And so I get to do exactly what I want without founding the organization. Mm -hmm. So full disclosure, have you guys founded or started something um, that you know something that you could have? Um, so until... yeah, I have not founded anything, yes. but I am. I have started my own podcast. 
Um, and it's something. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's it's something I started at the in the middle of last year, and I have just surpassed um, just over a thousand people listening to my podcast. Which is crazy. Um, so I'll tell you about what the podcast is later on. But um, you know, it was just something that I. Um, started because some friends said you are cool to talk to, and you have a lot, a lot of things to say. And I, I think that it, uh, it would benefit a lot of people to just have an open, honest dialogue about whatever the thing is that we were talking about at the time. And I said, you know what, technology exists. Um, I can do this. So I put a mic in front of me. I'll talk all day long. <laughs> um, and I, when I said, <laughs> well, there you go. Um, and when I when I was very young, I start. I wanted to be my own talk show host. I wanted to have a, my own talk show, talk show. But this was in the nineties, and <laughs> so you had to have been produced by somebody. You had to have like a network behind you. You had to, you had to have some, somebody actually like back you. And now it's 2020, and you can just sit a mic in front of somebody, you know, upload it to the internet, and there you go. Um, people will listen. So I have started something. It's I haven't founded anything, but yes, I've, started I've started something. And Elizabeth, you. Yeah, so I, I um, have been very lucky in my career to have wonderful mentors and wonderful female mentors, which was very important to me. I've always wanted to work for strong women. So my first boss, who I worked with for seven years, we started something called Start Smart Career Center. But it's really, it's not a nonprofit. We wrote books. We have a blog. Um, it's more of a hobby. I've never made much money <laughs> off of it. Um, but it's exciting because when we were very passionate, I wanted to tell young women what she told me. And so the way that we did that was by writing books and blogs and getting the word out there. And I never expected it to be a full-time job. Job, but it's nice, you know, after 5 p.m. I can come home and, and sort of have that creative outlet and, and post blogs and, and all those good things. And we still work very closely together. Nice. That's all to say that not being a founder doesn't mean you can't have ideas or be creative or be entrepreneurial in spirit and, um, you know, have side hustles or whatever. It just means that you are you don't have to go out and start something all brand new all by yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just kind of curious, um, what are the pros and cons? Um, to working for some of these larger organizations. I've worked with at least two of you on in larger organizations, and I can speak to some of the issues I've had. My background's mostly administrative and financial, which are very different from the pros and cons that you would experience, um, especially mm -hmm. under the policy side. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I guess, uh, so Pew is actually the largest organization I've worked for. It has 1,000 people, um, and most of whom are based here in DC, but there are you know, folks overseas. And, um, the pro is that you're working for the, the, in, the infrastructure, right? So, you, so you're, you walk in and you have a computer and you have, you know, you have a, a paycheck. everything you need, paychecks, <laughs> healthcare, Electricity. Um, you know, <laughs> IT support. Um, you also have the, uh, to me, it was like the power of the organization behind you. So, um, the interesting thing about Pew really is that like it has such a reputation for all the different work it's done in different fields that it was it's much easier to get meetings. It's much easier when you publish something, people pay attention. I mean, it's kind of it's amazing, right? And and you know, it's amazing also because Pew is very focused on making sure that what it produces is quality and informative and readable. Um, so that's that's part of that. But you're part of that whole process and system and you have a lot of support you know we have a whole government relations division we have a whole communications division we have people who do social media for us so you know like i don't have to be tweeting everything right i have the, the, there's all these things around me that amplify what i'm doing um you work with a lot of smart people it's really great um and so there's a lot of to say the, the power of the organization that you join um the drawbacks can be that you know Organizations also, it can take a little bit of time to, if you have a new idea, it can take a little bit of time to socialize it internally. You know, things it's, it's not as nimble or as fast as maybe a small organization um, uh, would be because they have certain ways of doing things. Um, but that's also part of where you learn kind of the internal advocacy that you need to do within an organization on your behalf and on your project's behalf. So. Yeah. I'll talk a little bit about um, pros and cons, because um, I've worked in small spaces and big spaces. One of the pros about working in 
um, a large organization. The larger the organization, the, the more the presumption is that all of the people that you're working with, this community of people that you're working with, all believe in the same thing. You all are working towards generally the same goal. The con, smaller con, is that your level of passion for that thing is not always the same. And so the, the amount of effort and the amount of um, energy and time and money that, you're, that you think should be put into that varies from, and the larger the organization, the more the variation that is. If you have a small organization, then you are generally more on the same page, more or less. Mm -hmm. So there's that. Um, larger organization con is that the larger the organization, the, the uh, more bureaucracy there is. There are more rules, the more structure, the more people and sort of levels of ego and nonsense that you have to go through in order to get a pen. <laughs> like, you just have to like go through all these steps. In a smaller organization, you can just say, listen, we've got to get pens. Like, somebody just give me a pen, and <laughs> somebody will give you a pen. <laughs> so the, <laughs> <it's> a, <laughs> yes. um, so there, there are sort of pros and cons to um, both small, or, uh, small and large organizations. Um, the other thing, personally, as the person who um, is not the founder and more part of the team, um, is um, the larger the organization, the more my title means. And not that I'm a big title person, but being the executive assistant to the CFO of Kaiser Permanente probably means more than being the executive assistant to, you know, the CFO of uh, <laughs> the CFO of Kaiser. You know, just a little bit. Tiny bit more. <laughs> um, so, you know, there is something to be said about the name recognition and the backing that you can have with a larger organization. So, yeah. And I would just say, I, at this point in my career, I wanted um, sort of a medium sized organization mm -hmm. because when I worked at GW, it's so huge that you had to sort of scrape for anything that you needed. And that's very challenging, right? That hierarchy is very difficult. Um, when I worked for tiny organizations and I couldn't get a pin, that was also <laughs> difficult. So um, CSC is, we have about 500 staff nationwide. There's 50 of us in headquarters. We are small enough to do things quickly. I have to go through one person to kind of get what I want, um, but we're also large enough to make an impact. And I, that was incredibly important to me. I just, I didn't want to be stuck on either side of that. So this is, you know, for me in a nonprofit, it was the perfect um, sort of in between and just yeah. one other point is um, the larger the organization generally the larger the mission the larger the mission the longer it takes to see any sort of real impact or result mm -hmm. so at a Kaiser Permanente you're waiting around for like years to see like the effect of one particular study or one particular piece of technology that you innovated mm -hmm. at a smaller organization at a smaller nonprofit you're like we're gonna go out and like transport these catered like leftovers mm. and that's like immediate you can yeah. see it yeah. it's, it's happening within a smaller amount of time that, that i just want to say that, that. that's actually perfect because my next question goes into um essentially that this uh, this morning we heard from um several of our panelists and a lot of especially founders of nonprofits have a very niche discrete description of what they do and you know they they transport the food mm -hmm. um that's left over from events <clears throat> or um, you know, they review grant proposals. It's a very specific um, thing that we do. Whereas uh, other organizations that have been around for a little bit longer maybe take on some of those larger uh, policy issues, the laying the groundwork. One of the people that we work with in Funded List um, calls it you know, owning the whole chain of impact, right? So if you go in and you all of a sudden create um, better water in a small community, <coughs> Um, how, what is the impact of that on the community? Yes, they have better water, but were there cultural norms around going to get the water? Were there people designated for that? Was that a job? Was that, what, what are the other implications of having solved this one problem that now has created perhaps, um, perhaps not, other issues down the road? Um, so some of these organizations that have been around for a while and have these established reputations are able to tackle some of these bigger underlying issues and I think that's something for especially um, Elizabeth and Anne can maybe speak to the ability to feel that impact on the policy side and see the role that you're able to have, um, you know, not just maybe on the day to day, but on these larger issues. Yeah, I was going to say when Marquis was talking, um, us being the size that we are, we did something probably one of the most incredible things I'll ever work on in my career that I'm super proud of. A couple of years ago, um, my boss was approached by some folks who said, are you aware that, actually, I'll go ahead and ask the question, does anybody in this room know that there is no cancer treatment facility on any Indian reservation in this country? 
What? There's no specialty care on Indian, any Indian reservation in this country. It is beyond the scope of the Indian Health Service. So that's, that's always the response. No one knows this, right? So these women approached my boss and said this, and she was like, this can't be right. They had, like, they, they, like no, what? No. And so we literally picked up the phone and called every single reservation, and they said, no, we, they get a set amount of money, and they have to send folks off the reservation mm -hmm. to get their treatment elsewhere. So Kim, my boss, who's extraordinary, she's worked in the organization for 20 years. She's not the founder, but she's pretty close, said, let's fix this. And we all kind of looked at her like, okay, girl. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> We just served 200 patients on the Navajo Nation. Wow. And she did that by saying the Indian Health Service can't do it. It's beyond their scope. Let's do it. So we raised money. She went out there and talked with folks. It took us years to establish trust with the Navajo people because they were mm -hmm. like, we've heard this before. We've heard, we've seen white people show up and say they're going to fix things. And then you just want a photo op and you go off on your way. And she was committed to the moment we step our foot on that land, we are going to, we're going to come through and we're going to accomplish what we said we're going to accomplish. And she did it. Mm -hmm. And it just goes to show, you know, we're not too tiny. We're not so massive. It's like turning the Titanic. We saw a problem. We worked through policy. We worked through fundraising, everything a nimble nonprofit can do and made it happen. And again, I think it will be one of the most extraordinary experiences of my life to see, you know, these folks who they traveled from one side of the Navajo Nation to Flagstaff where the closest treatment center is, it would be like traveling from New York to DC. Mm -hmm. And if any of you have ever had cancer or know somebody with cancer, you're getting chemo every day. You're getting radiation a few times a week. So you're making that trip over and over and over again. And so it just sort of goes to show the power. I think that medium, small nonprofits, especially put your mind to it and go do it. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'll use an example from when I was working with New Mexico Voices for Children, which was, you know, a highly respected uh, organization in New Mexico. Um, they had decided um, years before I joined them to uh, work specifically on budget and tax policy because there were a lot of providers direct, of direct service in New Mexico to um, the, there's a high level of poverty in New Mexico, including um, mm -hmm. all the pueblos and reservations. Uh, but they said, well, fine, everyone's providing services, but we really need to make sure that the state is investing in the systems and the programs that that will help people in the long run on on um, you know poverty and, and low income issues, and so one of my jobs was to track Medicaid and to make you know look at how the state was funding Medicaid and to make sure that when there were increases in state revenues that they also went to Medicaid and that the uh, Medicaid agency was um, maintaining its enrollments and increasing enrollments. Um, but around the same time, this very abstract tax issue started rising up, which was called a tax increment financing program that the state wanted to invest in, which meant that this company was coming in and saying, we're going to build all these fabulous houses on this mesa outside of Albuquerque, and we need state money to help us uh, do that because, you know, this is a risky business. And this was not my area of expertise. But we all looked at that and said, if the state starts putting money into development, this is going to mean there's less money for the programs that we're supporting. So we actually had to get up to speed on tax increment financing, um, figure out like what they were promising versus it, it super complicated. <laughs> it's basically a lot of uh, one of the arguments was that the Albuquerque, if anyone's ever been there, has very few ways to grow because there's uh, Pueblos on the north and Pueblos on the south and mountains to the east, so they really can only grow west. And now this big developer was like, we're going to develop on the west, but we can't do it without state money. And we're like, So we built a coalition of not just Voices for Children, but also environmental groups, um, other social service groups, to really get around this issue and make the case that no, this is not some abstract tax uh, financing question. This is not about revenues in the future that we would never get anyway. You are actually promising future revenues that would go to services for New Mexicans to this development. Um, and we actually defeated that bill in the legislature despite incredible, obviously, developer and business opposition. But you know, that, that's what, because New Mexico Voices for Children um, had the capacity and was able to, I was able to pivot and then we, we had the relationships and we could build stronger relationships with the coalition. That was what we were able to do. So that's great. And um, again, these are very interesting ways of having impact in an organization where you are, you know, one of several employees and, you know, it has a, a larger mission 
um, has been around for a while and very established. And a lot of these things would be much harder to do if you were um, a two-person shop. You know, we wouldn't be able right. to pull that coalition right. together if you were just starting from scratch and you didn't have the backing behind you of the New Mexico organization that had been around right. for several right. years. And we had the, I'm sorry, just some, yeah, New yeah, Mexico totally. Voices for Children was also, their research was known to be very good right. too, right? Mm -hmm. So that they were respected by the legislature already. Right? Mm -hmm. So they said when we came to them with numbers and said, this is not, right. this is not what you think it is, you're, you know, exactly. they, people listened. Yeah, so. a, a CSC or a PU walks in the room mm -hmm. and you automatically have a gravitas with you that um, just like Margaret walking in there and by herself. I mean, I'm pretty cool. Um, I can provide a song and dance, you know, I, I like anybody. But, um, you know, there, uh, my name is not going to carry the same weight if I, but if I walk in as pure CSC, that's um, really a powerful tool that you have. Um, and so I, one of the questions that I um, wanted to ask Marquis specifically was kind of, you heard him say that he's an executive assistant to the CFO of Kaiser Permanente which is a very unique role um, and kind of one, you know, where it may be hard to see the impact sometimes. And so if you could talk a little bit about that, because um, I've often been in the admin position as a finance officer and an admin person. And I know for me, sometimes that is hard to see how is what I'm doing, how are my budgets helping anybody? You know, I mean, Elizabeth you're very helpful. <laughs> yes, right? We love budgets. Always hire a good budget person. Be nice to the budget person. Very important because if you don't have the money, you can't do it. Yet. That's fair. But as that person, it's often hard. You know, yeah. to it is sometimes to see what you're doing in that in that vacuum um, plays out on the larger stage, and how is what I'm doing over here? You know, getting the um, Navajo Nation mm -hmm. access to cancer care. Um, so I think if you want to speak a little bit about that, you had a really great story earlier. Ah, so um, uh, I will start out the sort of this story um, talking about ego, right? And the and the role of ego in my personal life, and the role of <laughs> ego as it relates to the people that I have supported and work for. Um, so um, <laughs> where to start? All right. So no um, in it, the room. <laughs> I'm going to try to make this actually a, a compact story because I have a, a, a way of sort of spinning out of control. So um, it relates to one of the other questions Margaret asked me was how I got into this type of work, administrative slash executive assistant. I did not choose it. It, is not, it, it sort of chose me. Um, so I was in, when I first started out, I was 20 years old. I got my degree in theater. My mom said, get a job, a real job, <laughs> like an actual job. So um, I started out, I was a receptionist for a chiropractor and did that for about a year and a half before the chiropractor decided to retire. And I was like, oh, okay, that's a thing. And I had a little bit of savings, but um, within a short amount of time, about a three month turnaround, I lost my job, lost my apartment. And I couch, couch surfed for about three months. I'm not three months, three weeks or five weeks actually. And then I was homeless. So I spent uh, 10 weeks on the streets of Baltimore, actually homeless. And um, finally got over the nonsense tip that I had with my mom. Moved back in with her and she said, I'm a paralegal. You're good at spelling and word perfect at the time <laughs> and uh you know go to a temp agency and go do something and i did and then i started out as an office clerk at the department of agriculture and 15 16 years later i'm the executive assistant to the cfo for kaiser permanente um and about seven years into this career and i didn't think of it as a career it's just something that i was doing um, I had a frank conversation with the person that I was supporting at the time, and he said to me, um, out of nowhere, this was not prompted, I wasn't sort of asking for positive reinforcement, which I often did. Um, <laughs> he said, you know, I want to let you know that what you're doing actually matters. The fact that you can clear off two hours of my calendar out of a week for me to have think space, that actually matters. The fact that I don't have to think about dotting the I's and crossing the T's and doing all of those, that type of work that I, first of all, I'm not great at, but also I'd rather actually be fundraising and doing other stuff. That matters. It actually matters that you are here because without you, I don't know what the fuck I would be doing. And I was like, <laughs> wow, okay, that's nice. That's cool. 
and he gave me like you know a little bit of a raise and i was like okay and but i didn't think it was really a thing and then it happened again a couple years later and somebody else said it to me and i was like is this a thing can i actually do this and i had to make a sort of a a um i had to have to come to jesus with myself to say just because i'm good at it does that mean that i like want to do it or should be doing it and ultimately i came to the decision personally for myself that yes this is something that i really enjoy doing it and it's not something that i hate like i'm good at things and there 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 are things that i'm good at that i don't like that i'm good at them but i do them <laughs> um and this is something that I'm, that i really enjoy and i actually am having an impact um and it's awesome awesome yeah yeah. And I will say, every time I mention Marquis and his story and like what he does to my friends who work in almost any space, really, and their eyes just light up. They're like, where is he? Can we can we get him? <laughs> we, want, we want a professional executive assistant. Where are they? <laughs> and I was like, yes, you can't have him. <laughs> he goes anywhere. He goes to unfunded list. <laughs> so, the, so the one other thing that, that just about having impact, um, both in a large organization and a small organization, I was going to say is that currently at Kaiser Permanente, um, um, well, at the at the regional office that I work at, um, they are trying to do a lot of intentional work around um, HIV AIDS, mm -hmm. and um, as it relates to people of color, and they're very good about it, and they're you know at the at the cutting edge of doing that the technological work and sort of. Uh, forward-thinking work as far as treating it. Um, where I come in is that I came from an organization called National Black Justice Coalition that was at the intersection of um, LGBT and uh, Black people issues. And I said to them, "Listen, if you want to, if you want people to like buy into this, this is how you talk to Black gay men. I'm a Black gay man. Listen to me. Like, <laughs> this is your play. Like, and because it was a lot of sort of people who were well-intentioned, right?" A lot of white people mm -hmm. who thought they knew, right? And that goes back to ego, right? I'm, I, it, it was, it was, it has been difficult for me to break into that space, but I'm always like, because it's an important issue for me, I'm like, listen, <laughs> just pay attention because you can save a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of money if you just listen the first time and like do what you can. Obviously, there's bureaucracy, but I did, I am having an impact in that way, and it's. I'm not the founder, but I, I am having an impact. Can I add on? I think yeah. that that's incredibly important. I work really hard to have real relationships with everybody that I work with. And I know that, you know, for instance, there's a young man right now who's a cancer survivor and he works in our development department. I know he's really interested in learning more about policy. So we're having a Hill Day and I'm like, come up with us, please work with mm -hmm. us. I know that there's a young woman who really wants to increase her public speaking skills. So I'm like, go hang out with the communications department. Just because it's not your day-to-day -day job doesn't mean, you know, if if we're working on HIV with, with gay black men, don't come ask me because I'm not going to know, right? <laughs> so find out what people are passionate about and yep. tap into that. And it will also enhance loyalty and get people to stay. Because mm -hmm. if they see that you're willing to invest in them and you're like, look, let's get you to conferences. Let's ask for your opinion. Let's invest in you. Then people will stay, stick around. Absolutely. Which yeah. feeds into okay. um, one of the, oh, go ahead. Okay. Oh, so just so, especially yeah. if you're working in a large organization. I mean, your team is larger than the people who just report to you. Mm -hmm. um, we have um, good we have great finance people and they they are so interested in what we do. We make sure we copy them and whenever we publish anything, we you know, when we congratulate ourselves and our team <laughs> for the publication that we finally got out the door, we also include our communications team folks. I mean, it really is like you 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 no matter actually no matter how large or small your organization, you want to make sure everyone feels like they're really part of the mo forward motion and the success of the organization. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Which, um, great segue. Well done, guys. You are just, thank, thank you. We're um, professional. <laughs> yeah, right? Hire some theater folks and this is what you get. Because <laughs> um, one of the discussion topics this morning was the struggle sometimes being a founder and finding the right team to support you mm -hmm. and getting um, the right people on your side um, early on and down the road and as you grow. People talked about hiring, you know, 1099 consultants versus staff people. Um, so, as the folks who are who are that team, you know, how, what advice would you give to founders, especially on how to find the Elizabeths and the Marquis and the Anns of the world, aka the cream of the crop? Um, keep them happy, make them want to invest not only in the organization but the mission, and you know, be around for longer than a year or two and help grow the organization to the next level. 
Well, I'm a social worker. I firmly believe that everything in life comes down to relationships. And whether it's the relationship you have with your staff, the relationship you have with corporate funders, whatever it is, it's relationships. If I don't have a genuine relationship with people, nothing's going to get done. And this is this is going to sound trite because everybody says it, but it's it's trite because it's very true. Um, higher, slow, and fire fast. And the best lesson that I've learned over the past year is I work on behalf, we raise money for cancer patients. If somebody is working with us that's not doing their job or can't do their job, get rid of them. Because, and I don't mean that to sound harsh, but you're letting down people with cancer and we raise the money. We're letting down our funders who are giving us money for it. And if somebody's not doing a great job, they can't be happy there, right? Nobody wants to come in and just make a paycheck and then leave. And so I have recently helped to segue people into other jobs. I'm not just going to say hit the road, but let's sit, sit down and talk. I don't think you're happy. You know, it doesn't seem like it's a great fit. What do you want to be doing? And then I'll connect them with other people. Um, but you have a responsibility in the nonprofit sector. There's a reason you're a nonprofit. You're working with people who need you and you need to take that incredibly seriously. Um, and so I have had a job posted since September and I won't fill it with the wrong person. I just won't do it. So I'm waiting. And every time I talk to people, if anybody's interested, come talk to me afterwards. Um, every time I talk to people, I say, I want to find the right person. I have to backfill my position. I'm going to post it soon and I will find the right person. I will not fill that position with somebody who's not passionate, smart, and there for the right reasons. And I will interrupt just for a second. Um, one of the things we talked about was the opportunity for growth, not just, you know, your succession planning of becoming president, right. but also the idea that you join one of these organizations that has some, some levels and some uh, size to it, knowing that you have some place to grow mm -hmm. in the organization. Yeah, absolutely. When I interviewed, so I've known my boss for a long time at the organization that I work with, but when I interviewed, I said to her, she's been there for 20 years. I said, what's your plan? What are you going to, are you going to be here for another 20 years? What's, you know, what's the deal? Cause I don't, I, I want to grow. I want to enhance my skill set. And even if I was in an organization where I wouldn't be promoted, I wanted to know that I was somewhere where I could learn and enhance my skill set. And I wanted to be learning from people. So that was incredibly important to me. If I had come in and they said, you're going to be here. This is the only job stay there. It's not the right fit for me. And I knew that was really important. And it's, they promised me something and they said, if you come in and knock it out of the park, it will happen. And it has. And that was incredibly important to me. Are you going to say something? No, I have thoughts, but oh, no, I have lots of thoughts. <laughs> okay. Lots of thoughts about this particular okay, topic. Have, sorry, no, go ahead. Wait, All right, wait. yeah. Um, so then Mark, you can. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think there are two things. Like I'm hiring for, a, you know, at Pew now, I hire for a team that's pretty stable. Um, but we definitely take our time in hiring. Um, we actually have the entire team interview uh, the person because, you know, everybody has to get along. Um, and at different times, we've also had some of our communications people come in and because they're practically embedded in our team. So um, you definitely need to, to give it some thought and make sure, you know, I always look for obviously the baseline is the qualifications, but also the ability to be flexible because no job is exactly the job that you thought it would be, or even that we, even when we write <laughs> the position description, by the time the person comes on board, they, something might've changed. So you need, you need people who are willing to be flexible. Um, my other thought about having worked for, when I worked for Survivor Corps, I was working for the, the founder and he, the organization had already been around for, uh, I don't even want to do the math, 10, more than 10 <laughs> years, um, and had been greatly successful. Um, and I think that two things was, um, in watching, you know, in watching what, in watching, you know, being in, being inside the organization, I think it's very important when you're a founder to hire people who aren't like you, um, because he was very entrepreneurial. He was very driven. Um, you know, he needed folks who could balance that out and also sort of think more about the details and not always be the big picture people. Um, he also, I think, one of the things is important to realize that as the founder, not everybody that you hire is going to be as entrepreneurial and as passionate as you are. So you do you do need some worker bees. Mm -hmm. um, who are also happy to go home at the end of the day and not think about this 24 um, seven. So I think that those are considerations too. If you're actually looking to be a founder, you need to, to, to think that you need a broad range of staff and you also need to be willing to have the uh, staff speak the truth to you. You, know, you. you can't be like, I'm the founder, I know best. Like it goes back to like, listen, like mm -hmm. hear, hear from everybody. So. Yeah. Uh, no, go. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So, How much um, you guys got? <laughs> well, yeah, so I've, I've watched this happen on more than one occasion. So everything I'm talking about is something that I've seen firsthand and have in some instances experienced firsthand. First, if you can help it, 
Don't hire your friends or your family. Don't. Just, not even if you can help don't, it. Don't. <laughs> don't I mean, do like, it. I mean, there's like literally like maybe one instance that you might hire your friend or your family. But like my mom has hired me and it does not work no. out. <laughs> I've seen other people hire them. Even when I, when Dave hired me, I was like, okay, Dave, like, <laughs> here's what we're going to do. And here's what we're not going to do. And it was, and it's a very specific, clear thing that you have to be um, mindful of. And the, the, um, the easiest thing in the world is for, because particularly in nonprofit spaces where you're all working with the, the, the people who are like-minded and working towards the same types of goals, you become friends with those people. And depending on the level of friendship, it can be very easy to be like, oh, yes, I like this person. They seem nice. I'm going to hire them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's like just just tread li lightly. But if you, I mean, if you can really help it, do not hire your friends and family. That's number one. That, if you don't leave anything, from, from what I said, <laughs> don't hire your friends and family. That's number one. Number two, um, a lot of people, including myself, um, feel like we are very good about interviewing, right? We all think we know how to interview. And the thing about when you're hiring and getting the right team, you have to ask the right types of questions. You have to know what is the role, what do you think the role is, right? So that we're all on the same page because you don't want to hire somebody that you have cross purposes about, oh, I thought it was this and something, it's something else. And can they do the actual job? So um, one of the instances, um, the examples that I uh, was talking to somebody about earlier is <clears throat> and I got hired. Um, no, I'm sorry. I was hiring. I was the hiring manager for a particular position and um, interviewed the person. They seemed fine enough. And that was for a social media position. And um, after the interview, I went to look at their social media page. And that person actually posted just had a great interview at Unfunded, and on, this was on their social media page. And I was like, look at that. Like, that made me, like, that was just an extra step to say, you know what, this person is on their job. They're on, like, they're, they know what the fuck they're doing. Like, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, but it... it, it <laughs> well, there's that. But the, the I've also seen it where um, I've also been involved in the interview process, and somebody has sent a thank you letter back and said, you know, um, dear Marquis, name spelled wrong. Um, I, you know, I would. I'm so glad that I got to interview for with you for the executive position, uh, executive assistant position, and spelled executive assistant mm -hmm. wrong. And I was like, yo, like, like, what are you doing right now? <laughs> like, what's happening? <laughs> and it made me. You have one job. You have one job. <laughs> you, don't, you don't even have the job yet. <laughs> and it made me feel some kind of way. So it was, you have to like. Not only just know the right types of questions, but know what you're, what specifically you're looking for, and know ha, have a person who has the right um, skill set for the job you're working for. Just uh, looking for just because you um, you might have a development manager open, and you might have an executive assistant, and just because the person is good at development managing, may, does not mean that they're going to be good at this other thing. So know the job you're looking for, and know the types of skill sets that you're looking for. And the last thing that I will say, I told you I was going to go on. Um, the last thing that I will say about getting the right team is going back to something um, I'm not sure which of you said earlier, is uh, it's about passion. If you have somebody who um, is only there to get a paycheck or has literally very little idea about what cancer research is or you know, what uh, HIV AIDS means to this particular community and they're just there, then they are mu much more inclined to leave. You're going to be mm -hmm. interviewing again and again. And their money, you invest a lot of money and time in the interview process. So mm -hmm. you have to make sure you get the right person the first time or the second time if you can help <laughs> it. But all that to say, don't hire your friends and family. That's it. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, yes, so don't hire your friends and family. I think that's kind of the takeaway from the yes. whole, yeah. whole panel today. Yeah. Don't hire your friends and family. Fired. You're fired. You're fired. You're fired. You're fired. I'd rather be Marquis' friend. There's other, there's other executives. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Well, you're here. Oh, man. Five minutes. Okay, I was going to say, um, yeah, I'm gonna say questions and answers. I have we could talk all day. Again, this is my soapbox because I like to believe that everyone can have an impact no matter what they're doing. If you're a volunteer in an organization, you still can help that organization go to the next level and do their mission, right? Um, so 
I'd love any questions from you guys for our panelists, um, for me. Yeah. Yes, yes. What was the name of the podcast name the blog? Ah. <laughs> the name of my podcast is uh, So Here's the Thing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and what do you decide? I knew it's fake. <laughs> 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 uh, so it, the, the, I still haven't actually, this is probably the worst space to say this in, but I have not come up with an elevator pitch for it. I, will, I can tell you generally what it's about. I've had um, not 10 episodes so far, and it, usually, it basically comes down to me having conversations with people from vastly different backgrounds from my own and just sitting down and learning from them. Um, the four guests that, five guests that I've had so far have had, um, it's a mom with special needs child, I have no idea. Um, it's a, a friend of mine who was a Jehovah's Witness and left after 20 years and grew up a Jehovah's Witness. The third person was a, 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 another friend of mine who was a Mormon and six months ago left the Mormon faith. <laughs> so there's all sorts of different uh, variations. Uh, the other person that I um, interviewed um, was just an Asian woman who was in an interracial marriage and we talk about Asian sexual stereotypes in America, which is like crazy. And it's all like outside of my realm of experience. So, so here's the thing, go check it out. <laughs> <laughs> it's on Apple Podcasts, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. <laughs> Uh, on a far less exciting note, I, uh, it's startsmartcareercenter.org. Mm. And um, if anybody's interested, I have a house full of books that we've written. I'll send them to you for free if you want. So. Nice. Oh, questions? questions? No? I mean, what? You want to sing a song and dance? I, mean, I actually have a question. Yeah. Uh, first. Uh, I want to say, uh, Margaret, every time you take a couple hours off of my schedule, that matters. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, no, I do, and I, hopefully I do it enough, but not too much. I do, well, I do know how valuable Margaret is, and that I don't pay her enough, and I, and I do stuff like that often uh, to try to you know, keep her around so I can constantly have, your, have the support. I'd love more tips on that front, uh, and I know there's some other founders that would be founders in the audience that like, um, um, what do you want from the founder? The plant was good. <laughs> I get every single And the tacos. And the tacos. tacos. I get tacos every, every Wednesday. Yeah, we do oh, every week. Good. On Wednesdays, we yeah. have tacos. So if anybody's around on a Wednesday. And you're all welcome. <laughs> yeah. If you ever want to join us for Wednesday taco lunch, uh -huh. tacos <laughs> on I mean, I would probably say the, the one thing that um, as a support person, as part of the team, as, as opposed to being the founder, one of the things that like I said, everybody has an ego. Even I have an ego, right? I'd, no. li I'd like to, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'd like to be the person who could take the credit for having started this wonderful thing. But I'm just the, not just, but I'm the guy behind the scenes who's making it all work. And I do have opinions about the mission and the, and the, mm -hmm. and the uh, sort of the direction of the organization and or policies or how we can do things better, faster, more efficiently. And I, I, would like to be included in those conversations as much as I can without having to like be the guy who always has to stand up and force my opinion and I'd like to just be included in own conversations because I do have a, a, a body of sort of ex experience that um, could go a long way towards making things better for your organization so that's what I would say. Yeah. Two things. Um, one is sort of very practical, but I think it's incredibly important. Um, and it's I try to give a card to someone in my life every single week. So mm -hmm. I've been stalking and hoarding cards and they're all just like feel good cards. And I give them to I send them to friends I haven't talked to in a long time. I give them to coworkers. And again, it's sort of like your one thing is don't hire friends and family. My one thing is it's all about relationships. And you would be amazed how important it makes people feel to get a mm -hmm. card. And it doesn't matter what the card looks like. Um, but it's incredibly important. So that's kind of practical. The second thing, and to your question, sort of about what can a founder do, as our CEO steps aside, she has specifically asked me, what I've been here for 20 years, what are you gonna do that's different? Because she doesn't wanna know that I'm just gonna keep doing what she's doing. She wants to know what, how my personality is gonna change the organization, what's important to me, um, and how I'm gonna put my own stamp on it. Because if I'm just there as a yes woman for her and to just keep doing exactly what she's doing, then why would I become president, right? Um, so I thought that that was really insightful on her part to say, look, I'm stepping aside for a reason, it's time for new blood. And the fact that every day I'm getting older and I'm no longer the youngest person in the room ever, um, but the fact that they're looking at a succession plan for someone relatively young, I think has sent a message to our younger staff that there's room mm. for growth here. And they've a lot of the younger staff have come up to me and said, like, this is amazing. Maybe I could be president one day. And so that messaging has been really important. Yeah, that's awesome. 
And I think um, from my experience, you know, working with the founder, I think one of the things I would say is um, the, the team, you know, that's supporting the founder is often very bought into the mission. Um, and a lot of it is about recognition mm -hmm. and understanding the uh, importance that everybody is playing in this huge, usually huge push that is happening, especially in the early years. Um, but I also think the founder needs to, so there's, there definitely needs to be appreciation, like I understand. Even if you can't pay people a lot, a lot of it more has to do with recognizing mm -hmm. people's roles and, and listening to their suggestions so that they feel like they have, have some say in what's going on. Um, and also um, watching for burnout, right? Because um, mm -hmm. there are people who will like be trying to do the, you know, what they'll be working really hard, but they'll also get burnout and they might not be getting the same kind of, I don't know how to describe this, but like, the um, person I worked for was had an incredible amount of energy. He was getting a lot of validation from the um, very powerful board that he had put together, and he was always thinking of the next thing. So no sooner had they had success in this area than he was already, because he'd been talking about it with everybody else, yeah. onto the next thing, and people felt like their that success wasn't being recognized, and that was mm -hmm. really demoralizing yeah. to people. So um, just take time, and also every once in a while realize you may have to slow down a little just to you know, make sure everyone's coming along with you. Yeah. So. And I'll say there was a comment that Marquis and I talked about earlier. Um, and it's it's useful if you have people who have been through multiple positions and multiple jobs, um, and not only just to listen to them, but they have advice that you can use. They've seen founders, they've seen other organizations and how they've done it and how they've done it poorly. <laughs> so <laughs> listen to them and take their advice and be like, oh, they have a, a wealth of experience um, across the board that is useful um, in this scenario. So mm -hmm. I think that was an, an interesting point yeah, to me absolutely. earlier. Um, you know, I've worked in so many different types of organizations. I often have to pause the person. I need you to put, listen to me right now. We're not going to order this. We're going to order that. That's crap. <laughs> Don't do that. And because the longer you've been in this type of work, the more you can sort of stop somebody. And it's those types of right people that you want on your teams. Yeah. That's it. Cool. Any other questions? This has been super. Oh. No. Um, so talking about um, the issue of not hiring friends, uh, I run a nonprofit in Nigeria, and uh, it's been like five years. Starting, you start with friends who have like passions like you, and over the years they've shown loyalty mm -hmm. and they supported you know what we do. Um, before I came for the fellowship in, in the US, we all worked at different places, you know, you know profit because we're. In, uh, public health practitioners, but then at the same time we, you know, through the nonprofit, design short-term projects that we, we do. So we invest even our money, we raise funds for those short-term projects. Even while I'm here, they're still doing a couple of things. Uh, but then going back, I want to scale up. We want to look at five years programs that you know would require some level of hiring and getting a lot more people into the project. So. Um, how do you balance this? You know, you they also would want to be interested in being part of this process and now you want to scale up the big money is coming. How do you get everyone, you know, to be part of it? Go ahead. So so here's the thing. <laughs> uh, um, the thing about uh, hiring your friends and family is it goes back to what I was talking about earlier, ego, right? If, you, if I hire my mom and she's like my CEO or my whatever it is, and but she only, her skill set is here and the big money's coming in and needed to be here, I don't want to have to say to my mom, hey mom, you only have these skills. Like that, that's why I didn't, I didn't hire her in the first place. It's, it's a thing. Like I don't want to have to say that to my mom. So if I'm, if you're in a situation now where you need your current people or you want to bring on more people, more of your friends who have a different skill set, you just have to make it about the business at that point. It's literally like this grant, this proposal, this whatever it is, this money is coming in and I need it to be like all bullshit aside, like here is what it is because otherwise it's not going to work. And then you've lost your friend, your family, it, you have a strained relationship. You're working, trying to figure out, oh, is my mom going to do the right thing? Nobody wants that. Like, you really don't want that. <laughs> so if you can avoid it, try not to hire your friends and family and just make it, make sure that they know that you would, as Dave said, when he just fired me, I, <laughs> like, I want you as my mom. I don't need you as my CEO. Mm -hmm. That's it. 
And if you do keep them around, make sure that the um, communication is very clear mm -hmm. as to the expectations that we do want you uh, functioning up here. This is the expectation now. Absolutely. So if you are going to stick around and see us at the next level, this is where we need to be. Um, so that, you know, they, if it is something they've been around for a while, they've already come along with you. Um, but we are taking it to the next level. So we need everyone to step it up. If you can do that, that's great. If not, I'd, I'd rather keep you as a friend. Than, right. Or mom. Or mom. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, I know we want to... Mom um, told me we have to stop. Yeah. yeah. Because you know, I, I want you guys to be able to have dinner and have a life. Thank you so much. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.